<laughs> if you ever want to spend some money, uh, have you ever been up to HGR Inc. In I've Cleveland? heard good things. Um, yeah, I have, like, I have a buddy. It is amazing. It's it's kind of like the scene in um, Indiana Jones where it's just this giant warehouse. <laughs> It's just this massive facility. It's this old military base. Oh, the I didn't know that part. Leaking. It's huge. I mean, I don't know how many square feet it is. A million square feet or something. It's, it's enormous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. It, Are you being serious? I'm being serious. It's not huge. Me. And there's just like, yeah, there's holes in the ceiling. So if it's a rainy day, you can't go down this aisle because it's just dripping on you. But <laughs> they've got just, someone has an automation, a factory that they just tear down. They just rip out the automation line, just plop it in aisle 38 <laughs> so if you want to get a bunch of 80 20 it's an amazing place and just the weirdest stuff is there but i have really a friend that cool buys is... hand tools from there he's like it's like 20 bucks for a drill if you just buy a lot of them you can there's you can handle like, like the milwaukee makita like good shit you know and so you can get robot arms you know abb robot arms that are there they may not have Seriously? a control system but there's the arm i got <laughs> i went up there and got metrology granite like actually multiple pieces oh yeah they had a whole aisle of metrology granite it was like 10 cents on the dollar compared nice. to buying new so i went up there bought it i got it i had a air table with it um That's awesome like really legitimately nice stuff welcome to collaborative with spencer kraus this is a place for accomplished professionals to talk about their life and their work in an informal and hopefully an insightful way if you like what you see hit subscribe below enjoy the show Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Mike Formica. Mike is an all-around great guy and also the president of Naya Systems, a company that makes autonomous trucks for the military. Mike, welcome to the pod. Thanks, Spencer. Appreciate it there today. Wish yeah. I could do it in person, but the uh, schedule didn't quite work out, but it's the new normal, right? No worries. Yeah. I mean, we're, we've never been better equipped to go remote, so. Yeah, that's for sure. Happy to be hanging out, even if it's not in the same room. Yeah, this still works. Yeah. So, so as you uh, see, I'm here in my uh, my man cave. Nice. Which, um, yeah, it's a different one than I usually see you in, I feel like. I, I think this is probably the right one. Maybe the lighting's off or something. I've actually been, um, when the when COVID hit, my kids were both going to school from home. My wife was working from home. So we all kind of had to scatter to find different corners because I was trying <laughs> to do work. You know, I've got one of my kids. and I got a physics test. Can you help me with this? Or, hey, did you see what happened in the, in the game last night? And it was just getting to be disruptive. I love spending sense. the time with the kids at home, but we kind of need to find our corners. This is the corner I ended up settling in. So uh, I'm in the back corner of my workshop right now. Is that but the new external building or is that the... Uh... This is the old original workshop. Oh, that's why I have it. Because last time I saw you were in the new one. So that's that was the difference. Right. Here's the interesting problem with the new one. So I built this uh, 1,500 square foot workshop, that which is. I am just thrilled about. Lots of room for lots of big toys. Um, turns out, of all the things that are not available in today's world, we're worried about chips for computers, garage doors. <laughs> um, I'm glad Love you it. find it funny because it's screwing me right I'm now. I'm sorry, brother. Uh, no, that's all good. Garage doors are six month lead time. So Jesus. I'm like, uh, I'm going to build it. it in order? Yeah, but I put it in when the garage was done because I was like, I want to see what it looked like. So I want lots of windows, a little bit of windows. Like, you know what? I'll wait till it's finished. I'll order the doors, figure I'd give it myself a month and install them. Now, nah, six months. So the problem now is Fuck. it's a little bit cold. It's a little bit hot. I've got this just wide open to the elements. So I can't run the heat or the air conditioning and fight the uh, the fact that the whole bottom is wide open. Yeah, it makes sense. So, it's going to cost um, you tons of money and not be effective. Exactly. So I've not fully moved. In fact, I've only moved over a little bit of things so on a nice day like today. I could sit out there. I've got a desk up there with my laptop, but most of my equipment's still back in the old shops. So this is the old one. Makes this is sense. like a third of it. Um, but the new one will be nice and big and get some new toys in there. Badass. Yeah, no, that's that's a cool space. I'm jealous of it. It's uh it's really nice. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward. I'll ha we'll have you up, maybe we'll do a podcast there yeah, in, we'll in a up. year at this rate, the way the uh, <laughs> we'll see when stuff shows up. I just got a field microphone, so I got a blue snowball. I recorded the last episode from uh the Greek island of Crete. The internet nice. there was horrible. I had to do it off my cell phone, uh, wireless. But yeah. um, I, I met this Welsh computer game programmer uh, and just brought him in, you know, because he was a nice enough guy. I wanted to make an episode. But think so. about that, where we're at today. You just kind of show up in the middle of nowhere, pull your cell phone out, and actually do something meaningful. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a little it's different back in my day. 
Uh, I mean, you're still doing stuff. You're, you're running a business. So. Oh, yeah. No, I'm just, I remember my first job didn't have email. Yeah, my first job out of college, email didn't exist. Um, and we were still getting note. You know, you had like the, uh, those little pink things that you had a receptionist, someone would call you, they'd write it on a little pink piece of tablet paper. And <laughs> that's how you got your messages. And I don't even know how we did work without email. But yeah, we did. And it's just, so it's kind of interesting seeing that transition. I mean, I got the, that generation. the Saturn five was made without email. The, the space shuttle, man, did they even have CAD for that? You know, like uh, all the tanks in World War II, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it's all paper. I mean, my first CAD was doing it with pen. You know, here's the eight different pencils you have to use of different widths and thicknesses. So that's what I learned. And I remember getting, they had a, CAD, a CAM, this was a CAM course, uh, my senior year in high school. And there was like one computer for 20 of us. Holy crap. But How did like you get right on that thing? You just, you fought for it. You, know, you, worked, <laughs> you get three, three or four of you would you get into class early and you'd say, okay, let's work on this together. And you kind of teamed up. It was like a little bit of survivor. Nice. But that's what it was like. And you know, I was in elementary school when I first saw a computer. I don't remember what it was. I think it was a Wang. It was like a you know, black and white monitor, big thing. And they played some like adventure game or something on it. But <laughs> the, the teachers had no idea what to do with them. That makes um, sense. But the, the cam stuff was kind of neat for the first time. It was the first time you actually saw digital technology. But that was yeah, that was late 80s. So it's yeah, kind of cool awesome. to see the before and the after that um, not everybody gets to see. Yeah. And still, be lit, and still be literate at it. I was, I was decent. Like I, I was kind of, uh, like a child, like I was, I was doing more stuff than the other kids at school. So I, uh, I was born in 88, so a young fuck, but I, um, <laughs> so just to be clear, you were born in 88, that story about cam happened in 87. So nice. Okay. Was... Yeah. So yeah. So Thanks it predates for me. That. <laughs> yeah, for sure. it, it but in does. kindergarten, we had five and a quarter inch floppies on, on, it sounds like a similar computer to what you're describing. Cause it was for kindergarten. They just gave us whatever piece of shit. No one else wanted. And right. then, um, in, when I was in like first and second grade, I could beg like an older Mac. Cause I went to a pretty ritzy school. I could get my hands on like a, I think it was like a Performa 6400 or like they had those Mac clones Motorola was making in the mid nineties. I could get my hands on one of those. And I was maybe like, like seven or 10 years old, somewhere in that range. And you know, if, if you just, you know, like hung out with the IT guy, he'd give you old computers, the school was thrown out. So that was how right. I sort of learned about it was, it was just getting the, the trash and taking yeah, my apart first computer was a Vic, a Vic 20, which nice. I still have somewhere up in this mess. I have it up there on the shelf, believe it or not, Badass. because I don't, I don't throw anything away. Um, and then when I was in, it would have, I guess, been either junior high or high school. They had an Apple II computer and I got, the oh, those things are cool, man. The double, the dual floppies on it. They didn't make um, that many. I don't think either. Did they? I mean, the Apple I one is so. like a total collector's item, but the Apple II was still pretty limited release. I was such a nerd I, for that stuff. Probably. But that's, that's when I first started pro was that the Vic 20. And then that thing is what I started did, to learn to program. Did you ever take it apart? Cause I heard that like Steve jobs and Steve Wozniak signed the inside of the chassis injection molding, but I don't Even know. Even I was borrowing it from school and I wasn't supposed to be in the first place. I wasn't about <laughs> to take it apart. Fair I take enough. apart everything else I can, but that was one I did not. That would have been pretty cool to see though. I'm curious if that was actually, if that's real or if that's like an urban legend, <laughs> but uh, go, let's go to find, go to eBay and let's go buy one and take yeah, it and down. inside. It'd be fun to find out. I'm sure hipsters actually, have driven the price way up now. They're probably like three grand or more. Yeah, probably. We actually Listen. did that at my uh, last company. We would just buy random stuff on eBay just to see how it works. So we were building laser That's scanners. Cool. Um, we were trying to figure out, you know, what's the best mirror systems and how to, you know, we didn't know anything about optics. So um, <laughs> we got some late HP laser printers. There's a really interesting, um, you know, there's a, basically a spinning mirror in there. And just Wait, the way they did the assembly. Oh yeah, like, like a lidar kind of. Kind of, yeah, it was like a hexagonal mirror. Uh, it was an injection molded housing, and they had just a little uh, TO can LED LED diode uh, pointing at this mirror that just spun. And because it was faceted, it would basically, you know, as it as the angle rotated, it would spin it. And then once it got to the end, the next facet would come, but just immediately retract. So it would just go from you know it was like a, just a raster scan out of this hexagonal mirror. It was yeah. just an interesting way to approach it with a continuous spin. So um, probably fairly yeah, quick too. Like that, that explains how they're able to get it to like really blaze like that. It it just there's no retrace time because as soon as it ends, it immediately again the fat the angle just it resets it at the start. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. 
So we just learned a lot taking things apart. So we had a habit of like once a month, we just go grab some random thing on eBay. Uh, some were more interesting than others, but that was that was one of the cooler ones. That sounds like fun. Yeah, it was it was pretty good. We had a good group of guys over there. Nice. That would have been uh, Three Rivers 3D for the listeners. Uh... Yes, Three Rivers 3D. I started that company in 2008. I think every company I started started in a recession of some sort. So you know, I did telecom in 2000. So that nice. was a great idea. Um, we talked about the dot com. I lived that month. That, that was a nightmare. All of our customers went out of business. We were like, we went Holy from crap. zero to like $3 million in a year, which wow. back then was a lot. We're profitable. We're growing. And we're like, okay, we're going to conquer the world. And then the companies that were like billion dollar companies were getting acquired and then they, they get acquired by a company and then they'd be gone the next month. Wow. Um, it was just crazy. seeing these, just the, the bloodletting that happened and it happened quick. Um, yes, yeah, so I did that in two, I started that company in 2000 and then cool. um, the lane departure warning about 20, 20 years too early. So everybody's making billions of dollars doing uh, self-driving car work. We were doing lane departure in the early two thousands. First oh. lane departure system. We we're 20 years too early. Mobileye was our, biggest competitor they got bought by a few billion bucks by intel so Damn. we thought we had a good acquisition until i watched them a few years later so the timing's <laughs> not been my forte for sure and uh yeah three started three oh, yeah, rivers man. in 2008 right in the recession um so uh, four times maybe the charm we'll see yeah I'm, either it will be or it won't um i just shifted my focus to uh working as uh the director of advanced projects for this company form logic so is yeah, the so first time I've announced it on the podcast, but um, yeah, well, congratulations. I, I know that's course slowed down, for. case slowed down to basically zero to, to be able to focus on that. So, so what are you going to be doing there? So um, my job is to look at like, um, so honestly, I mean, because it's a startup, it's a little bit of everything. Uh, on their website, they've got $40 million in, in venture funding right now. Um, but they, they've raised a Series A, we'll say. Um, and um, they... Um, are looking to just explore um, sort of how to scale their shop. So if you look at their website, it's um, it's a pick, and I wouldn't say do it now, but like check it out later. It, it's kind of cool. Um, basically, what they're doing is just extreme automation of manufacturing and an American machine shop that's like right here in Pittsburgh. And so oh, there you go. The idea is just you know scaling and automating like end-to-end -end machining processes and being able to hit high tolerance um, high precision parts for aerospace now, medical is that for and frontier industries internal usage or selling production lines with this new capability so um right now we're looking to just sell production so you know basically machining um so say you want parts made uh, typically you pay a machinist to do it in-house well you can pay us an hourly rate and we'll do it um, and we can hit better repeatability and precision, you know, because we automate it and, you know, it's, it's computers. And so we're just trying to, to go for scalability. Got it. Okay. Well, you know, my, I, I love manufacturing. I think it's great to see somebody doing stuff domestically, especially in town. Uh, it's way too easy to say, yeah, just throw it over the, the fences, let somebody else do it. And I think we lose a lot in that process. So I'm glad you guys are working on that. Yeah, no, it feels really good. I mean, and, you know, if you want to get like a little bit political, I mean, you know, the only way we're going to be competitive to China is if we get really, really good at automation and we already are good at it, but we could be better at it. And so it's fun we're, to be working on that good, problem. They're better. The Japanese are better. We've, um, we've, we've tended to invent these industries and then just let them die. You know, we, we don't really do, there's no, not enough robotics companies in this country right now. When I say robot, I look at robotics as factory robotics. You know, Carnegie Mellon definitely is mobility, right? Things with wheels, yeah. things that are moving around. And that's great. But to me, robotics, my experience with robotics has always been factory robots, the things you'd see in Detroit. Yeah, and for sure. uh, that's an area that I think we could still do a lot of damage in this country and do really well. Um, but yeah, and competitively, yeah. I don't like getting political at all, but from a competitive standpoint, we need to do that sort of work. Well, for sure. I mean, and you know, I mean, yeah, you want to be competitive. I want my company to be competitive. Um, I want to be competitive. I want our country to be competitive. I mean, you know, it's just, you know, it's whatever you can do to help the team, right? So right. Yeah, absolutely. It. Well, you know, we're seeing the supply chain thing. Everybody's looking at the, the ships on the shore, but there's a lot to be said. When something's coming from, you know, halfway across the world, you lose access to the supply chain. You lose the ability to, to see the parts being made. And it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. 
when you're building something and, and I used to do this all the time. I mean, I had a bunch of vendors I've worked with in town and I would just go see them in the shop. I made a habit partly because I was cheap, but partly because I wanted to see those guys. I'd pick up production runs like, Hey, I'll stop by and pick it up. You know, so I go to the, I do that too. but you know, you, then I'd learn about anodizing and I'd say, okay, well now I see, now that I know about your process better, I can do things on my side to make your job easier to make my costs lower. And, you know, I've gone to my machine shop, um, Path Enterprises out in Beaver, and I'd go out there with a part and a Sharpie. We just start marking and putting holes on it. And, you know, that's it. We do drawings, but sometimes we just brainstorm together at a table. And that's just hard to do when somebody is halfway across the world. I just took a um, whole bunch of Sharpie marks off, off of parts in order to uh, be able to take them to ARM uh, annual yeah, member meeting. So I, you know, I was like, these Sharpie marks are awesome. I love them, but they're not going to look good on a trade room, trade, uh, show right booth, so. but yeah you get you, you get that so it's it, i think literally getting your hands dirty and, and touching it is is missing a lot these days yeah and i really like it um part of what we as a company are trying to do is help with being able to work on stuff remotely but i mean given what i do i'm, I'm trying to be on site as much as i can and, and so it's kind of fun to to be right there in the room and kind of be like a point guy for a lot of interesting stuff one of those things is anodizing by the way so you guys do anodizing in house? Um, I don't know what I'm meant to say on that, but um, okay, I, I'm it's just, doing it's a some nasty exploration process. on it. Okay, it's it's just one of those nasty processes that I I would build almost anything in my building I could, but anodizing is one I would never ever want to do. <laughs> so, just, what's been always... your experience with anodizing that you wouldn't want to in house it? Um, a lot of chem chemicals is an area. Yeah, you know, we all have our expertise, right? So my background, I've covered electrical, mechanical, and optical, yeah. chemical, chemistry, and bio. You know, bio is gross. You know, the squishy sciences, I just don't like it. <laughs> squishy um, sciences, it's funny. So uh, it's funny because my son wants to be a doctor. I'm like, that's great, dude. But don't my dad worry. was a doctor. I wouldn't do that shit ever. Like, <laughs> I know that's that's how I feel. But um, hmm. the chemical, you know, I just never never was a big expert in chemicals and chemistry, and so anodizing's a lot of that. You know, what's the acids? What's the concentrations? <laughs> cleaning the tanks, uh, just not the sort of stuff I've really gotten into more than anything else. There's nothing Makes wrong sense. with it. Just honestly, yeah. like not a chemistry expert either. So that's one thing where, um, not my sport. I may have to bring in some external help for that, but, um, there's plenty of people in town know what they're doing. So yeah, well, like I everything mean, here. you know, it, it may not be an in-house, it may be like something else. So, I mean, you know, there's, there's different ways to attack a problem. It might be similar. Yeah, don't get intro. We could talk. Yeah. It's always, always good to talk about those things. For sure. I did see like a DIY anodizing system where you take a bunch of igloo coolers and just set up the different acid baths. And I'm like, that's just like, yeah, I, did, I just didn't want Fucking to deal terrifying. with Fucking terrifying. Yeah, yeah, no, that seems Pretty dangerous. <laughs> yeah. I've ruined plenty of shirts back, in, you know, with you know, battery acid from, you know, it's car batteries and four-wheeler batteries and things. So, yeah, I don't need to ruin like my face. Yeah, I, um, I did get the Breaking Bad mask recently for some experiments I was doing. Um, but in research and development, I mean, as you know, I mean, you're always doing some weird stuff you never thought you'd be doing because a project needs it. And so, um, I mean, I have a full face dual cartridge respirator that can block chlorine gas. Nice. So, yeah. If I need it for that. Fun. <laughs> so. Yeah, I used uh, one of those when I was doing some uh, powder coating. Nice. Yeah, so it's a really fine powder. You want to use it. And I'm lucky I haven't blinded myself. I've had enough lasers in the last dozen years. Um, <laughs> I've got boxes of lasers buried in here somewhere. And some of them are way too powerful. And some what kind of wattage? Um, the stuff we were deploying was always 5 to 10. But I always found my way to 100 watt or just to see what I could do with it. <laughs> or 100 milliwatt. Excuse me, 100 milliwatt, not 100 okay, watt. Okay, that makes sense. I have, I have a, a 60 watt in my laser cutter. Nice. But... That's got all the safety systems. Well, they're mostly disabled too, so that's probably part of the problem. Mine's a twenty-five watt, so not not as big, but it's it's a Versa laser, so it's twenty-five uh, American watts. <laughs> yeah, my mine's a coherence, a little bit old. It's not the it's a it's showing Sounds its age at this point. Yeah. But the first thing I did is you, know, you just disable well. all the disable all the uh, the interlocks on it, so you can operate it open and do goofy stuff. So. Probably should do less of that. What are you doing with yeah. it open that you need it like that? Like uh, engraving the end of a thing that you jam through or something, something too big. Yeah. That you can't sense. quite fit in the right way. Or, um, I, I don't know, just print, just on principle. I kept my interlocks enabled. Uh, I probably should install an e-stop, but because the VL, 
uh, laser system I've got doesn't have a good uh, e-stop feature. My way of stopping it when it's ruining a part is opening the interlock. <laughs> so. I, I know a lot of people do that actually. Um, yeah, and I was having problems with mine. I got to use. I get a lot of used equipment. Yeah, mine's used too. It's a Carnegie Mellon throwaway. So. Yeah, mine was an Arden Stu throwaway. Nice. Um, yeah, same actually. Was, good find. Yeah, exactly. I oh, know. Not. Um, a, I mean, sorry. Mine was Margaret Morrison. So like the Carnegie Mellon School of Art. So same thing. Okay. Same idea though. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. This is the Arden Stu that was down on the Boulevard of the Allies. Nice. But it wasn't working quite right, so I had to make a lot of repairs. And part of it is when you're doing the repairs making sure the interlock circuit wasn't what was defeating something from working. So a lot of it was just, Oh, that makes part of you just, just get the thing to run. I, I spent about maybe two or three grand getting mine running after I, I rescued it from a dumpster. Yeah. I think that's about what I spent on mine. I get a new laser too, but everything Same. else was both. Yeah, the, the recharge was like 1500 and then I maybe spent like another 500 out of pocket. Yep. And I had to buy it. Yeah. To put a new motor in. I also had a, my, I had a Stratasys 3d printer here too. Oh, nice. Um, You've hacked that's that back... though, right? Cause that's such a waste of money to buy their filament for, Oh yeah, I definitely have the hack. I've got the hack so you can put in whatever material you well, it's still yeah. ABS, but I can put generic ABS and I, I got a guy I can just buy the chips from so you can kind of reset each cartridge. Nice. Um but those were this is before maker bots and things were out there. So they were for back then to get a printer was twenty, thirty thousand dollars. So I found a guy on Craigslist out in Philadelphia, had it, he goes, Yeah, it was broken. I called Stratus, it was gonna be ten thousand dollars to fix it. So he just sold it for for nothing. Uh What'd you pay? all the bearings uh, three thousand dollars oh good find man that's awesome but it was completely bound up every axis was bound up ah. and it was interesting it was a thompson it was a it's a round rail and it looks like a thompson thompson bearing in i'm like oh well maybe the bearings are just bad so as i ripping it apart i found the bearings were it was the bearings had completely disintegrated so it was you got these recycling balls the plastic had just it, it just had fallen apart so the whole thing was bound up but they weren't thompson it was a cheap knockoff oh they're supposed to be thompson branded and i'm guessing what happened they probably started with thompson rails which are great At some point they switched to these off-brand ones which didn't survive i got because i was able to get thompson drop-ins and the whole thing has worked beautifully ever since so i think it That's ended awesome. up costing me probably a couple hundred bucks worth of bearings and that was it but stratus is cheaped out on that and they were selling for 20 30 grand I, that's my pres i can't imagine anybody else who would have done it yeah that makes sense I mean, to me these are homemade bear i mean the guy that I bought it from wasn't doing it. He had a maintenance contract with Stratus. And they just said, yeah. we don't know what's wrong. We're just going to replace the entire drive assembly, which would have taken the bearings and everything else out with it instead of just the bearings themselves. Um, That's I don't know, but they, they were not the name brand ones you'd expect, but put the good ones in. And Given the amount of money you're paying on the sticker for that, you'd think they'd put, you know, like a hundred bucks worth of bearings into it. Maybe, maybe would, that thing is a beast though. There's a lot. I mean, there's a reason maker, they bought MakerBot because everything in their things over engineered, you know, the it's, four times bigger, stronger than what a MakerBot would be in every dimension. The motors are bigger. The bearings are bigger. You've got multiple bearings. Um, it's, awesome. it's, it's, a, it's built like a tank. Yeah. I suspect that they just, at some point, they were just, you know, people make those decisions like, oh, these ones are 25% cheaper. Let's just go with them. And yeah. by the time they realized it was a problem, it was probably too late. They yeah, you're right. Maybe, maybe they didn't even keep it, but like a few units got out and yours was one of those. And that's why I found up. I have no clue. I haven't, although the guy I bought the, the, uh, the hack chips from, I told, I gave him the instructions how to do it. Cause he had other people had experienced a similar problem. So there were other ones out there like that, but uh, yeah, I got that one. That was another find. I got cheap. Um, I've got, I bought a printer here, flash forge printer, cool. which I bought by mistake. I was trying to buy a resin printer and I, I Googled <laughs> the wrong thing. And I What's came out like, this it's just some cheapo. It looks like a big ladybug. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a kid's 3d printer and it makes all these goofy noises it's funny yeah, yeah. it's these nice are the cheapest be, drives it, it's super junky but for like it'd be like for an eight-year-old like you just load nice. it up and you print some like tiny little part but um that one did, yeah that one didn't work when i got it I, there was like this guy had a lot of printers that were you know as is so it's just to me it's like same fun. dude no different different guy okay if just some ebay guy but i again i I, I didn't read the description carefully enough. I didn't realize what I was getting. So that's just sitting here <laughs> literally collecting dust next to my chair. I've got an arrow wolf uh, that's basically being a boat anchor over there in the office. Just trying to give yeah, it back to the guy I got it from because I have nothing I can do with it right now. Yeah. This is a, a printer. I, I actually, when my kid, my son was in eighth grade. Well, actually, when he was in seventh grade, I started teaching computers at his school because the teachers just didn't really 
just weren't very good at it. So I was just teaching regular computers. And then I created a 3D printer after school club that we just teach them how to use a printer. I bought a printer, uh, Lowell's bought, and they taught them how to use printers. And then when they were in eighth grade, they were still interested. So we built a printer from scratch, which is what I have sitting behind me now. It, it looks like it was built by eighth graders, but it worked. They got to go to the science fair in the spring and they had the, the printer that they had made. They're really proud of it. It was generating parts, but cool. it's on my to-do list to strip down and kind of rebuild the. the yeah, it way. makes sense. They probably missed a few things. I, um, I got a, uh, Soldier Tech FP5 um, off a guy for eh, probably more than I should have paid, but not a lot of money. And um, I just remember every system I tore apart in that just being disgusted with the lack of uh, build quality, <laughs> we'll say. Yeah. And so no, these, these, these kids did pretty good, but it was a it was also a rush to get it done, too. It, so it was a dude I, I used to do battle bots with. And so I shouldn't I shouldn't be too mean on the guy. The guy is really nice. <laughs> and he's he's, you know, real engineer, but. It's yeah, just sometimes certain, you just got to take the shortcuts. Too. Yeah, I think that was his attitude. And so certain things were just kind of hacked. And I think a lot of it was just Folger Tech's design, too. Like, they just had these crappy nuts, and they used all thread and put a bearing on it. So, like, the bearing was, like, grinding against the all thread. I don't know. It just was like... Yeah, I'm not a big fan of all thread for things like that. Yeah, know? same. And then, so I pulled those out. I put in shoulder bolts. I added um, thrust bearings. Um... You know, all the wiring was unshielded and was, like, through terminals. Uh, and then, like, nobody had put on, you know, like, uh, rings or, or spades. It was just bare wire and terminal blocks. I, I don't even know if they used terminal blocks, now that I'm thinking back. Like, it might have just been twisted together. And, like, yeah. it, it was just the laziest from an electrical perspective. And so I just ended up ending up with a paperweight because I overcomplicated it. And I catted up all these panels and I laser cut all these, you know, different bezels. And then I just, I, I just didn't finish it. <laughs> yeah. I've had a few products like that as yeah. well. I bought myself a, uh, a wax 3d printer at one point, the 3d systems wax printer. And I have no, it was huge. So I yeah. wanted to gut it and make something else out of it. But after sitting in my garage for probably five years, I'm like, I'm just never going to rip. This yeah. Out. Well, that's the thing by the time, like when you, when you do that and you invest too much time in a project, like by the time you realize you've done that, it's obsolete. <laughs> Yep. Done. And that's what that's this this one was. And I was like, well, I could just steal the motor motion control systems out of it. I'm like, but I that's it. I just I, I did an there. eBay sweep and I, I probably had like five to ten grand worth of stuff I just stuck on eBay recently. And I'm just like, should I just gut this thing? Like it's only gonna depreciate more. And so right. like... <laughs> if you ever want to spend some money, uh you ever been up to HGR Inc. In I've Cleveland? heard good things. Um yeah, I have, like... I have a buddy. It is amazing. It's it's kind of like the scene in um, Indiana Jones where it's just this giant warehouse. <laughs> it's just this massive facility. It's this old military base. Oh, the I didn't know that part. Leaking. It's huge. I mean, I don't know how many square feet it is. A million square feet or something. It's, it's enormous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. It, Are you being serious? I'm being serious. It's not huge. Me. And there's just like... Yeah, there's holes in the ceiling. So if it's a rainy day, you can't go down this aisle because it's just dripping on you. But they've got just someone has an automation, a factory that they just tear down. They just rip out the automation line, just plop it in aisle 38. So if you want to get a bunch of 80 20, it's an amazing place. And just the weirdest stuff is there. But I have a really friend that cool buys hand tools from there. He's like, it's like 20 bucks for a drill if you just buy a lot of them. You can, there's, you can hand draw like, like the no, Milwaukee, Makita, like good shit, you know, and so. You can get robot arms, you know, ABB robot arms that are there. They may not have Seriously? a control system, but there's the arm. I got, <laughs> I went up there and got metrology granite. Like Actually? multiple pieces. Oh yeah. They had a whole aisle of metrology granite. It was like 10 cents on the dollar. Nice. Compared to buying new. So I went up there, bought it. I got it. I had a air table with it. Um, That's awesome. Like really legitimately nice stuff. Um, yeah, that's cool. Coordinate measuring machines. I, I bought one machine once. Just did they know what it was, others. or were they just the yeah. business? Okay, so they know what it is, but they'll sell it for less because they they're getting it for so cheap. Yeah, that makes um, sense. this stuff is really, and the longer it sits, the cheaper it gets. Yeah, so the one that's sense. got a lot of dust on it is more negotiable than the one that's clearly pristine. But yeah. they've got great stuff up there. It's a, you could <laughs> lose it. You just spend a day just looking at how things were made. Yeah. Right there's a machine I've never. And I don't know what this is, a potato just, peeling machine or something. I just gave away a drill press that was taking up floor space, but it's it's like a 50s or a 60s craftsman that, I mean, the thing must have weighed like 200 pounds. Like, it, I mean, it felt like lifting a body. It was fucking heavy. Yeah. But, um, I, I, I mean, you know, they don't, they don't make stuff. Well, 
and I know it's kind of a cliche to say they don't make stuff like that anymore because I feel like the stuff we saw from back then is the stuff that survived up until now. So we're biased, but I don't know. Well, CNC machine tools are right. You get a bridge port, you refurb a bridge port, it's still a pretty good piece of machine. Yeah, I agree. Just... Do they still make those, or is that like an outdated? I, as far as I know, as it's still know, around. Right? I th I think so. Yeah, I think so too. Although I mean, the I've never bought a... set the standard basically. Yeah, I've never bought a new Bridgeport. I bought a couple of used ones, but I've never actually bought a new one. But I, I think I've never had the space to set one up. <laughs> I've wanted one for a while. Well, that's why I built that new garage. I've got room for one now. I just nice. haven't. I got to get heat in there first. That yeah, makes sense to me. So it'll maybe this time next year we'll see. Yeah, who knows? I, I've heard the more jig boring machines are good value for money if you want something like a little bit more precise, but with yeah, a smaller decide... envelope. Yeah, I don't know what I want to get yet. I just I have room for anything. I just don't know what it's going to be. I think one of my friends, um, I probably shouldn't go into detail on this, but he ended up with a Cincinnati through a, a trade of some kind. And uh, I mean, you know those Cincinnatis. I mean, they're they're just oh, yeah. massive castings that you know you can take huge chunks out and not shatter the thing too bad. So kind of cool. Yeah, I'll be I'll be. Uh, strolling HDR and Craigslist when the time nice. is right. At Form Logic, we're running Grobes um, and uh, Dusans and one other make. I mean, I just started, so I'm trying to right. remember, but it's it's a sweet setup. I mean, it's just a lot of, oh, we're running like some lower cost Haas machines just to get a benchmark on that. And so it's it's fun to see what's what's there and, and get a feel for all these all these top of the line CNC machines that are coming out now. I think machining is an underappreciated high tech capability. I think people look at machinists as this dull, dirty old technology and it's just not. No, it's it's, it's impressive. I mean, if you've ever watched what I'll call CNC porn, but those videos, you know what I'm talking like the nine axis machines just using yeah. active tooling, you know, doing crazy dodge and dive cuts. I mean I, I watch all those sorts of videos on YouTube, like yeah, you know, the the CNC machines. I also like the like the um, automated fruit like the blueberry sorting machines because people talk <laughs> about I'm going to build a robot that's going to you know pick apples or whatever, and that's a nice idea until you see just how fast these current processes are. Like the idea that I'm going to go eh, mm, grab, pick, come back, drop, and meanwhile the, the machine's got like ten tons of apples in that same amount of time and. These like blueberry sorting machines, they're amazing. They use machine vision and a puff of air. So they just, they're going by oh, and smart. this camera sees it and it just poof, push, pushes it. Like there's a, an air gap. The yeah. velocity is such that it clears the air gap, except if it's green, this little puff, puff of air just pushes it down. Into, into oh, that's so cool. Pile. And you have to watch with a high speed camera. I'm like, it's just when people, I think not enough people spend time watching videos like that to see what true I mean, production is really capable automation, of. Automation, like at, at high speed like that. Um, where you've just got a massive line and you're moving. I mean, that stuff impresses the hell out of me. I agree. And, and the fact that you, you build it to last 20 years, I mean, you know, it's just, it's solid. Yeah, my first job um, out of college was at a company called Aerotech in town, which most people don't know of, but they're... That's a recruiting firm, now. right? No. Oh, we, well, yes. Aerotech is a recruiting firm. I don't feel like an asshole anymore. That's good. I I think that's Aerotech with a K. Okay, different company. Aerotech CH uh, does linear positioning systems or positioning systems, high, very high precision, nanometer level motions. Um, and they're an RDC park. But they're one of these big companies in town that people don't really hear of unless you really are into the space. Um, and I'm, I, I don't know how big they are now, 100 million, 150 million. I, they just bought another building. So they're, they're certainly growing really well. That's um, their yearly revenue or their market cap? Oh. Well, I have no idea. They're, I'm just guessing at their revenue, just okay, based on how many it. cars. Right. Like I have, I'm just saying they're they're a, they're not a ten million dollar company. They're a hundreds of millions of dollar scale company. Cool. Um, and when I worked there, my job was as an application engineer was basically just to go around and meet with customers and talk about okay, here's what's your problem you're trying to solve, and then here's our product for it. And I got to see manufacturing plants all over the country. And, you know, at the time I didn't realize what a formative experience that was. So you work for a company, you learn one thing about what they make and everything made stuff in house, but then I go and see all of their customers, you know, laser machining companies, disc drive companies, semiconductor companies, circuit board assembly companies, and see with their manufacturing as well. And um, I mean, it was several, I worked there for a few years and boy, it, 
it was I every time I got to go to a manufacturing site, my eyes just got big and I would drool. I would just love going to those places. Yeah, yeah, I get um, I get excited too. So I, I, I had one friend who was um working for a manufacturing automation company who would uh I don't know that he was supposed to show me the things that he showed me, but I um I got to see lines worth tens of millions of dollars, you know, that were I won't say who they went to because I don't want to get anyone in trouble, but you know, it, it's some of the stuff I saw, I mean, you know, it's, it's truly impressive. I mean, just the level of automation, the speed, the precision, um, the ability to fix itself and reject bad product. I mean, it's, it's, it's impressive. Yeah. There's, there's a lot more to it than people give credit to. Yeah. Yeah. For I sure. I think they have an easier time hiring manufacturing techs if people saw what, how advanced it really is. Yeah, that's an interesting way to put it, actually. So, do you think it would just be more of a sexy job and people would want to do it more, is what you're trying to say? I, I think there's a mis misconstrued perspective on manufacturing being a, a dirty job that nobody wants. Because yeah. at one point it was, right? I mean, sure. steel mills in town, I mean, people made a lot of money, but wasn't exactly an easy job. It wasn't a job you aspired to do. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I don't know that. I mean, it's an easy job now. I mean, if you do. Know, I'm not saying it's, it's not. Yeah. yeah, I don't think any of it was ever easy. I just don't think people, people wanted to go do. You didn't say, I want to grow up and, and work in a steel mill. I that makes sense. Did, yeah, yeah, you're going to get miners long, you stupid idiot. Why would you want to do that? So I think um, people just shied away from manufacturing for a long time. But when you see a, a really advanced modern manufacturing facility, it's it's interesting. It's technically challenging. For sure. uh, it's not dirty. I mean, everything about it to me is it, it's great. I I've love been in it. Summer, but... like I mean, I, I don't know if I would do this or not, but you know, you when you're walking through, you feel like you could eat off the floor. Like it's so clean, you know. And, well, definitely and... don't want to do that. Yeah, I would assume. <laughs> <laughs> in case you're wondering, definitely don't. Yeah, fair enough. But well, what I'm right. saying is like a clean shop where you know there's no storage space designed it on purpose. Right. I mean, there's certain principles they follow. Um, our our shop was like that. We had yeah. um, everything was a tiled floor, you know, washed wax floor. I mean, white white walls. I mean, it looked like a what was it? it looked like a hospital, but it looked closer to a hospital than a steel mill. Nice. Um, this is three rivers three D or a different one. This three rivers three D, nice. and we did it. We were very kind of a hybrid lean. Uh, we couldn't do single piece flow um, just because. Yeah. We did like tiny batches, so like batches of six. Well, that's like pretty good. Piece flow, yeah. um, and it just had to do with things like you know glue drying and curing. So sometimes you just had to that do things sense. in some batch that processes. That always takes forever. There's just some. So, but yeah, all the inventory was stored at the bench on the floor, and it was designed so that yeah, if we got, a, I could have one person run the entire line. Oh, cool. Or, it, or if business was big, I could put two people on, and they work like I literally had benches facing each other. So you'd work on this bench and then wrap around to this bench. But if you had two people, they'd work on either side of the bench and. I'd be working on something and push it across the top and then you'd receive it and then you could start working and you'd slide it down the line. That's awesome. It was really cool. And when you see those things working, just the amount of product, we were turning out a, a 3D scanner every, I got, gosh, I think we got down to like 90 minutes or something. That's incredible. Um, For two, three things, people, two people? Yeah. I, one, I think, you know, I'm saying one person, the cycle time per product was 90 minutes. But I'm saying person. how many, how many humans did you need to hit that cycle time running the line? Oh, even one person will be able to hit the line was efficient enough. I didn't wow. need extra people to hit that, that cadence. That's cool. It just was, it was just a question of volume, you know? So one person could spit out X number of scanners a day, three people could spit out triple that, but it wasn't like there was an inefficiency by being one or three, one person could do the whole thing. So it basically just, scaled linearly. Yeah. That's cool. So it was, really um, cool. so we would do things like in the summertime when I get, you know, high school students in, which were cheap. We yeah, would just have them build up I'll batches of been, parts. Well be. Yeah, it's half as much as what I'm, or a third of what I'm paying my tax. So uh, mm -hmm. they would build up batches of inventory. So they might not build, you know, idler pulleys for three months because we had a couple of high schoolers build them for the whole summer. Um, <laughs> so we could save some money that way. But yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was fun to no, that makes sense. That well, one. that definitely isn't lean, but like, I mean, it makes sense. Maybe it, 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 I guess it's hybrid lean. There are elements yeah, of the line that still had the, you know, one tool per bin. You know, you had, this screw had this this bin. This screw went in this bin with this tool, and that was it. You didn't have, and it was marked. It was had a blue piece of electrical tape on the bin and on the <laughs> on the Allen wrench. Cool. And you just and you just worked it and just worked your way down the bin. So a lot of it was very lean, but then we made adaptations based on what worked best for us. That's awesome. Um, I mean, that's that was pretty cool. 
Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It was one of the, probably the most fun I've had in, in my career working was was building that assembly line. Nice. We did you know, 10,000 units or something. I mean, we were putting a lot of product out. Yeah, that's really All cool. built in Pittsburgh, right? When everybody says you got to go to China or you got to get outsourced, we did it all inside of a little 8,000 square foot building. Hey, man, I'm, I'm working product. on building stuff in Pittsburgh right now. It's well, exactly. I, yeah. I, so I like it. That's why I'm excited you're doing it. You know, Thank we you. need more people doing those sorts of things. Yeah. So, um, I, I yeah, recently cool. conbond my uh, my shop back at my home office as well, which is really fun. So yeah, um, I, we do the same thing. Our cereals conbond. We nice. my kids laugh at it. <laughs> <cereal wife>. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh no, I'm I, we have uh, we've got because we've got, <laughs> we got two teenage boys. So one's in college now, but um, you know we've got a couple up in the upstairs pantry. And when that one gets pulled out, you pull them from the downstairs pantry and the downstairs, because we have a downstairs, we've got shelves on the other side of this here. Yeah. Where we've got larger bulk stuff. We, we were kind of stocking up during the pandemic a little bit. And then when that last box goes, my sense. wife scans it with um, the barcode. Right <laughs> the market, That's and awesome. That's what I do. It comes right in and we get 10 more. And then we just kind of, yeah, it's kind of a Kanban. So it kind of, it That's a, no, that is, that's not kind of, that is a Kanban yeah. system. <laughs> so we just don't have the cards at the end. It's mostly the empty box. When you get down to the last yeah. empty box, well, the it's fact that you've cool. managed to figure out how to parse the barcode with stock on the box is still pretty it, cool. It, like, did that take any Target's doing got... from a software perspective, or was it just they make it no, easy? No, it's and Target's app. So if oh, you cool. go to the Target app, you can just so we have this stuff is all the stuff we get from Target. We have different things we get from Giant Eagle, but the yeah. stuff we get from Target, the dry goods we get from Target, are all done on short shelves upstairs and big shelves in the basement. Nice. And then. Yeah, and it, and we don't worry about batching it. Like as soon as it runs out, we buy that product. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. So every day we're placing order for something. I see. I, I was stockpiling before COVID, but I think it's just because I'm a lazy bastard, and I I didn't want to go to the store that often. So we just I, we didn't want to go into the store. We're I'll like, buy like gonna order three it. toilet paper. Like, but when I say toilet, I'll buy like three of the giant Costco things yeah. of toilet paper. Because I just don't want to go to Costco more than you know once every second month. You know, and so yeah, well, I, I get that. Um, yeah. I, we got, I do the giant eagle regular just because there's too many refrigerators. Yeah, I've started items. doing that too. I mean, and I'll, I like buying the frozen salmon from Costco and just sticking it in like one of two freezers. Kind of nice, just living by myself. You know, I'm just, I'll just stock up. But um, I, I've started buying fresh fish from giant eagle, even though it's more expensive because it's like, all right, this tastes pretty good. And it's nice to not be eating the same thing all the time. Yeah, you don't have to be cheap on everything in life, right? Sometimes it's nice yeah. to get something that's 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 good. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah a little a little little combine in the house, which is kind of kind of funny. That's hilarious. I love that. My wife's a psychologist, but she's just we've she's been living with me for years with this stuff. So uh, actually, we're, this will be our 29th year being married, so it's been a long time. Oh, nice. Um, so she's kind of picked some things up along the way. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, that's. Uh... Honestly, I kind of want to start combining my groceries now in addition to my shop inventory. <laughs> yeah, I don't have enough shop inventory. I, it's just, I, I don't have any turnover here. Well, the thing is, like, I'm over. one guy, so I don't eat, I don't consume that many groceries. So, but I have, I've got metric fasteners out the wazoo. So, I mean, that, that right. God. No, oh, yeah. No, it's, it's great for fasteners for sure. Yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I like to cook, so I've got all these fancy salts. So I've, I've got five different types of salt in inventory right now in my kitchen. So I've got the pink Himalayan nonsense that I, I honestly don't really like that much. I think it's a fucking um, snake oil, in my opinion. It doesn't yeah, really taste better. I mean, obviously, there's no nonsense woo-woo properties that people talk. I mean, it's a bunch right. of crap. I, I don't know. It's a waste of money. Um, but like, what I do like is the molden salt. So it's like the really granular, like giant ass salt crystals. Those are cool. Okay. And then the Morton's yeah. kosher salt is like the workhorse. And then I started getting this black folk salt, which is similar to the molden, but with just more minerals. And then I bought a bunch of fleur de sole when I was in France last month. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't do any cooking, so that's all. Like, I understand what you're saying, but it's just my wife and my son do most of the Sorry, cooking in the house. I'm so. a nerd in that way. <laughs> no, it's cool. I, my son loves it, so I think, yeah. think it's great, but it's just nothing. Uh, I found It's more, we, we've been on different schedules. The startup has put me on different schedules from the family. Well, it's interesting. You know, when every time I've done a startup, I want to make sure I maintain that balance. Yeah. So you, you, everybody works those 60, 80 hour weeks when you're building the company, and I've been for doing sure. it for 20 years. But I always made sure I was home every day at you know five or six o'clock, have dinner, 
well, just my wife and, you know, we go exercise together or when That's I had the cool. kids, the kids, once we had the kids, you know, go help me, you know, have dinner with them, read them a story, play, get them to bed, tuck them in, and then go back to the office for three or four hours. So that's you know, a good way had, to do it, I think. It really worked out great, you know, and it's they, from their perspective, I was always around, you know, I'd be I'd still could coach their teams and I was always there, but, you know, didn't get a lot of sleep through that. So Yeah, I, I, I've noticed I get better at that, though, as I get older, like, I mean, I, it, I feel it like turns really... the other direction eventually, by the way. Oh, shit. So I'm going to need more get, sleep soon enough. You get really good at, oh, I was great in my 40s at this. I could just work. I could say I did my best work between like 10 at night and 2 in the morning. Yeah, that's Seriously, like my peak hours too. I was the same way. But then then I wasn't. Now it's like I'll, I'll be lucky to, I mean, daylight savings is going to take me two months to recover from. Even the good one. You just, so, you know, once you hit 50, man, the sleep is rough. Uh, yeah, that to look forward to. <laughs> that's it, I feel like a genius because when my last night, so I, I spent a month in Europe before I started this new gig, and my last night in uh, in Paris, I just uh, I figured I, I would be better off and it would be more responsible if I just stayed up, dancing, at an underground club all night. <laughs> so that's what I did. I, I went out and you know I, I danced with uh, these two Scandinavians and then I hung, ended up hanging out with one of their dates. He took me to an after hours bar. I went over there and I just hung out. I stayed up. Um, I, I went and got a coffee like after I left the bar. <laughs> Actually, I, I got a, I got like three or four coffees at this coffee place. And then I just got on my airplane and I flew back to the States. And I've just been waking up at, you know, like yeah, that was very 5 awesome. or 6 a.m. ever since. I've been on perfect behavior. <laughs> and so, you know, if you're trying to get into a good sleep schedule, my, my advice to you is just stay up all night in a different country where <laughs> you dance with some scandinavians yeah i think yeah, i'm gonna hard exactly. pass on all of that I'm just... <laughs> but i appreciate the uh the idea yeah sorry I, maybe maybe not the most appropriate thing to do but no no it's all yeah, good it's... now it's uh no but a lot of a lot of long hours but yeah the, the sleep is harder it's harder i still could do the work that i used to do but it's, i just don't have that that energy is definitely palpable it's harder to put in those longer hours than yeah that makes sense. well how younger. much like sleep were you getting when you were doing the um sort of the the peak of that yeah there was a, when i was three rivers was had an interesting point where we were like on the fringe of we're about to go out of business and we're oh my gosh we're growing faster than we can possibly keep up um, we had like a one-year cycle we were literally saying i thought well, i said if something doesn't happen by christmas we're going to get through Christmas and I'm going to come back from Christmas. We're going to just shut this thing down. That makes sense. Um, we've all been there. And at least if you've same, a company. Yeah. If you're being honest, we've all been there. Yeah. Right. Some people want to pretend that it's all roses and sunshine and it's not. So yeah, I a hundred percent agree. I mean, well, maybe if you've held a full-time job your whole life or like you work at the DMV, you've never been there, but I well, think yeah, anybody but that's trying to do anything challenging on their own has been there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so that, so we were going to shut, you know, that was kind of like, let's go through Christmas. We get to January um we got a an acquisition offer from a company which was marginal and then we like a within a i think it was the day after i met with the company that wanted to acquire us um we met what turned out to be our largest customer ever wow. and um they wanted us to develop we were building scanners that were twenty five thousand dollars. they wanted us to build something that was a couple of thousand bucks so we had to completely redesign everything so there was like a nine month period where we went we had to design the entire product line from scratch and go to scale so we went from doing, you know, a dozen $25,000 scanners a year to doing hundreds of multi-thousand dollar scanners a month. Cool. Um, so that, that period of time, I was probably legitimately, I would work, I'd get the, yeah, again, do my thing, go home, have dinner, get the kids to bed, go back to the office at nine at night and work till four in the morning, go home and sleep for two or three hours. I mean, there was months of two or three hours and okay. it adds up. That took a toll. Yeah, that, would, that would get you, I feel like. And I could do it for, you know, three, four, five days, and then I'd crash hard. And then I'd that recover. And then do How long did you four, sleep for when you crashed, if I can ask? Oh, I don't remember for sure. Probably 12 hours. That makes hours. sense. It wasn't like it was two days. I, I can anything, hit but... maybe like four or five hours of regularity, I think, right now. And I, and I feel good about that. But, I mean, any more than that, and I start to get to a point where I, I, need, I have a deficit to make up, and it's getting made up one way or the other. But it's not good for you. You know, I put weight on during that time. I got out of some, some I, bad I, I fell asleep at the wheel recently and I crashed a car. Like that was, that was bad. That's really bad. Well, my second company did. It's funny you say that because I was talking, I teach that class at CME and we're talking about pitch decks. And you know, I was telling the system that was, you know, was lane departure warning would tell you 
if you left lane, it would also give you a drowsiness alertness indicator. It would measure your performance of driving. So even if you were steering out of your lane, like you could be beep, beeping and bopping inside your lane without ever leaving it, which a normal lane departure won't tell you until you leave. Ours would detect that variance and give you this alertness index. But I said, when I always talk to investors, I'd say, hey, don't have to raise your hand, but who here has fallen asleep at the wheel? Because everybody's had an incident like this and it's amazing and scary. It's really dangerous. Yeah, um, I agree. I was fucking terrifying. I yeah. woke up going through barriers and then I ended up in a ditch. I mean, it sucked. I'm glad you're okay, but that's not a... Me as well. Yeah. That's, um, but it, it's insidious because you don't... The thing that we learned is, and I did to, to myself on a trip, I had to go to a trade show in I don't know, Kentucky or something. I forget where it was. And I put this, I turned the system on, but then I disabled all the alerts. So it was tracking and logging my performance the entire trip, but it wasn't telling me, it doesn't give me any feedback. And then I was taking a log. I feel tired at 8.32 at night. I feel really tired at 9.05. And I would log, like, and then I went back. And what, what we discovered was that, for me at least, it was about a 30 minute difference. The system detected bad driving about a half hour before I thought I was. Driving, oh, that is cool. Which was really neat. And it was a great sales pitch and story to tell, but it makes sense, right? Because we all think like, Oh, I'm really okay. I'm not, you know, you're starting to get that little, those head nods or the, yeah. You're, By the time you're bit, like, you know, like get, get back at it. Like, yeah. You've like been you doing should, a bad you job. should probably go to a hotel and just get off the road. <laughs> and, so. and I will say that's the thing that I learned at that company. I spent so many times, logging accidents because i want to understand how serious this was and i was just like a lot of people are dying from it so i get any indication of fatigue i pull over right away uh, i don't even i don't try i don't push just it just I, I learned from being there just how bad it is but um do you sleep in the yeah, car or do you usually get like a hotel like what's your shtick coffee i've done i've done every <laughs> i've done every combination try to go uh, to a hotel if i can but i had a trip once i had to go to dc a couple years ago and it was just for a meeting yeah. And apparently it was like the policeman's national convention that weekend. I had no idea. <laughs> Every hotel was booked. I'm like, oh, it's DC. Uh, no. I'll just roll into DC and grab a hotel, right? I mean, there's a billion hotels in DC. In no hotels anywhere. I drove like 45 minutes out to find one and I still and I had a reservation and they were overbooked. So here I am, it's like one in the morning. I have a meeting at eight AM. With a reservation no you couldn't get in. Even with my reservation, I couldn't get in. So I drove back into the city, found an Eaton Park or a Denny. I think it was a Denny's, 24-hour Denny's, and just stayed at the Denny's, did some work till my meeting at 8, you know, and then uh, <laughs> did my meeting and got my – I was staying for another day, got my hotel, you know, that night. But um, so I've stayed up all night in the Denny's. I've done the – I don't like sleeping in the car. I'm not sure that it's safe, but I've, I've yeah. done it. But I've, I've done um, it. I'm not great at it. I've tried to do it and not been able to sleep. Yeah. The day I crashed my my car while I was driving, I um I tried to sleep and I couldn't in the car, and I was just like, yeah, I guess I'll just keep going. I can't get to sleep. Yeah, here. the hotel's worth it at that point. Yeah, it would have been. So cheaper than your deductible in your car, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't even put it through insurance. I paid out of pocket. It was uh, it wasn't horrible. I mean, it was maybe like four grand, but I could have done way more damage. Yeah. Luckily, I'm okay. That's good. I'm glad. Nope. Yeah. Just get the hotel next time. Yeah, I would think I will. Yeah. Also, just copy, I think, just to get over the hump with stuff like that is not a bad idea. And then just get where you're going and then crash. I don't know. Yeah, I find it, it's assuming it's close. Just, yeah, it just doesn't, after a while, it just doesn't work as well. Well, it just depends, yeah, it. how hard you're pushing. I mean, if you're hitting adrenal fatigue because you're just taking, you know, stimulants nonstop, I mean, yeah, you probably should just get the hotel. Yeah, exactly. But if you're not at that point yet, you can push with the coffee. Yeah, again, as you get older, those you just start making those decisions differently. Like, you know what? It's just there's not. I try to make traveling. I've done enough miserable travel in my career. I like <laughs> my travel. To, I don't need to be deluxe travel, but I don't want to suffer my traveling anymore. Interesting. You know? I, that kind of makes sense. I mean, so part of me, like, I enjoy going somewhere uh, third or second world and, and sort of just seeing how much I can get for how little an amount of money. That's part of the experience though, right? That's the yeah. trip is to do that. This is, I'm saying I'm going to Detroit for a, for a business meeting. I'm not going to drive. I've done the Detroit meetings at 8 a.m. where I would leave at, you know, three in the morning and drive out instead of getting in a hotel. I won't do that anymore. That's the sort of thing <laughs> that I used to do. I'm like, I won't schedule an 8 a.m. meeting or I'll take the hotel the night before, but that makes I'm like, sense. Yeah, I, so I try to you know, avoid those sorts of things. Yeah. So. I, had, I had an interesting experience on this recent trip where I, um, 
I thought I was being responsible, much like my uh, other story I told. But this time, I um, it was on the way out. And um, I originally wanted to go to Thailand before I ended up in Europe. But um, it was very difficult to track um, the entry requirements with COVID-19 going on. So I, I got a negative COVID test as per the U.S. Uh, Embassy's website in Thailand. I got my vaccination. I did all that. And um, I, I got to uh, Canada for one of my layovers because I was trying to save money on air travel. So I, I had like a million layovers. So I had a 12-hour layover in Canada. I booked uh, two days of an Airbnb. It was basically a flop house just to sleep. Uh, so I got in at 7 a.m. and my flight departed at 7 p.m. So I figure by the time I get here and get back to the airport, maybe I'll get like eight or 10 hours of sleep and then I can pull on there the night before, get caught up. I'll be on Thai time when I get there. It'll be responsible and good. And so I, uh, I got to customs, got to the Airbnb, checked in, slept, got back to the airport. They would not let me back in because my test was an antigen test, not a PCR test. Uh, so I spent like 400 Canadian dollars on a PCR test the next day, which I didn't at actually need. At least so, you're able to get it. You know, yeah. Those are not always easy to get a hold of. Yeah. yeah no, I mean, that, I paid the expedite fee is what it was. I mean, okay. they're charging me to get the results immediately instead of them sitting on it for a day. <laughs> so it's... it's Actually, quite a clever price discrimination technique, I thought. But... <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah. my throat's my throat's starting to fade here. So what what other what else can I ask talk to you about? Um, interesting. I mean, whatever you want. Like, I mean, we're just we're just bullshitting. Um, I don't want to keep you if you're sick, um, or rather, just you know, tired and been talking too much. But well, let me say, I'll I'll, so I'll, I'll just throw something out there. Yeah. Sure. I think the startup community in town is great. I think that uh, a lot of discussion of what are we going to do? How do we grow? What do we change? The one thing I want to see people doing more of is celebrating the companies that are making money, not the ones that are raising debt. There's become this weird cultural behavior now that, hey, I raised $20 million. Oh my gosh, congratulations. You're doing so great. And not recognizing that $20 million raise, which may be necessary in a lot of cases, For sure. is also a $20 million debt yep. that means you're still not revenue positive or you're at least not profitable. So I think that we spend way too much time celebrating the wrong things. And we need to, as a, as a community, focus on the companies that are doing, that are making money, that have customers, that are generating revenue, and not just celebrating science projects with, you know, big investment money. I honestly, those are the I, things that are sustainable. I completely agree. And I mean, I mentioned the, the series a that form logic has raised, but one of the reasons I'm really excited to be working for form logic is that my boss, the, the CEO of the company, um, raised when I say raised, I mean, earned $400 million in revenue with his last company. Right. Um, that, so that's different to me. That means he's got credibility, you know, and he's, you know, able to earn money and see a good business idea that's not just a ponzi scheme and so yeah not not to make I, it like too tied into my my current gig but i mean i, I agree with you I, I think it's i think it's more important to earn profit and not just revenue but profit than it is to um you know uh just get money from excited investors that might be a little bit uh just slap happy or wanting to see the latest great thing or doing what their friend is doing yeah, there's a there's a place for that. If that VC money helps get you to the next level where you need well, it, that's I completely that's great. agree on that too. But that has to be the, the end goal has to be a profitable business, and that just seems to get lost in today's world. Yeah, which is me being old a little bit, but it's also being very pragmatic. If we want the region to grow and thrive, we have to be making money. We just can't do it off of you know, somebody basically giving us venture capital, spending it, and our growth can't be off of venture debt. It has to be off of actual profitable. Well, uh, I mean, I, I think it's okay to grow off of venture debt so long as you have a plan for, you know, yes. conversion. And so... And that's what I... Yes, I agree. I, it, that's completely agree with that. It's It has to be a means to an end. It can't just be the end. I, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, I think we could be making a lot more stuff here. You know, there's, yeah. um, there's still just a cultural that... We don't have that culture yet saying I should just build it on my own. It's still just, I'll let it be somebody else's problem. So, you know, hopefully you guys are going to help that. You know, it's why I teach my class at CMU about, Hey, here's how you can build a startup company. You can do it yourself. Yeah. You don't have to just make somebody else uh, do the work for you because there's a huge competitive advantage when you've got, when you control your manufacturing. Well, and the other thing too, is, I mean, I think the more jobs you do and the more you in-house, the smarter you are in your processes. And I mean, there's, there's a beauty to self-reliance, you know, that 
Oh, I absolutely. Still, I sometimes lose track. I mean, it's easy when you're busy to say like, well, I'm, I'm very swamped. I, I, of course I need to delegate this and that and that, you know, and you know, it's, it's kind of a cop out because, you know, if you, if you delegate everything, then, then what the hell are you doing? You know? And so well, I think that's true. And you're right. Somebody's becoming an expert at it and they're figuring out, Oh, you know what, if I make this one little change over here, I can be more efficient and maybe they can make it and they're making, they're saving money or they can't make the change because they don't control the design. So I used to have my engineers work on the production floor. Oh, cool. I'd go to the production floor. I'd go to the production floor every single month for a couple few days. And I'd see what's working well, what's not working well. Can I help the production guys do something more efficiently? Or can I say, maybe I go back to the engineers and make a change to help the production people. Um, it was, it. you learn so much by doing it. Um, and we, our engineers were better because of it. And I, my production people go go to sales calls. So yeah, well, that's awesome. I mean, to, to have everybody rotating like that. And I, I don't, you didn't say this, but I, I would assume your people are probably more interested and more engaged because they have more of an involvement in the Absolutely. holistic operations of the company and they're doing more shit. They're not just, you know, tightening the same bolt every day. And so I, I had a point where my production guy saw that there was somebody getting a delivery for a product, um, you know, that was local. Was, our stuff was shipped worldwide. And, you know, we did, we had a, just a sales center somewhere else. But orders would come in, we just ship them out. It's like, hey, this guy's just down the road. So he and I got in the car and we hand delivered it. And the customer's like, oh, that's so cool. But then he got to see the customer. Yeah. See, and it was just, yes, there's an engagement there. There's a pride in what you're doing. Um, I mean, it was just healthy all across the board. That's awesome. That was, I said, Three Rivers is a really cool company. And we got to do some neat things while we were there. That's really badass. I, I appreciate you sharing these stories. I mean, I know we've kind of talked about it off and on, but I don't think at this level. So yeah, probably fun. not. Yeah, when I was at Assistware, it was a little different because we weren't as big production. Our production, we, we did more units, but the production was simpler. Yeah. So I didn't have quite the, the expansive plant there. But that was a funny story. The very first time I installed my um, lane departure system, we we'd land, landed uh, FedEx as a customer. Oh, cool. And yeah, that's a, they that's a bought, Fortune 50. Oh, I mean, you want that. They bought a lot of units. If FedEx was going to do it, everybody was going to follow. Yeah. So. We're down at Volvo. They were buying these. The, they were getting installed at, at a Volvo production plant, which was amazing. It's a huge plant, and I've got a hundred of these units. They're in the back of my car. We're driving down there. Um, I had a pl I hired a production guy. It was his first day on the job, and he's in the car with me going down to do this installation of Volvo. And I'm expecting to be like, there's a FedEx truck. Like there, as soon as FedEx trucks came up, there'd be a hundred in a row, right? No, FedEx. 10 different other companies, then a FedEx, then 20 different trucks, then another FedEx. They're all spread out. So yeah, it's like 11 o'clock at night. The first FedEx truck rolls off the line with our system installed. I'm like, this is awesome. They go to turn it on. Doesn't work. <laughs> I'm like, all right. They're like, hey, we got a whole QC check. We can't hold down the production line. We're going to go park it in the in the rehab lot over here in the dark where it's, you know, CD and nobody wants to go over there. And the oh, lights no. are blinking. And I'm like, but you can't go over there yet. We're just going to park it there for now. I'm like, all right. So I'm getting a little nervous. Hour later, next truck comes through. It doesn't work. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is bad. Truck number three, it doesn't work. Oh no. At this point, I got the plant manager saying, we're going to pull this thing out right now because we can't afford to be refitting all these trucks and having, you know, a hundred more of them that are bad. Well, it turns out the next 97 worked perfectly. <laughs> that never happens. The, the first three were all installation problems because they were uh, brand new. So like the one they forgot to put the fuse in uh, because this was a new product. So they had to put the yeah. fuse in the block. The second one, they forgot to connect the cable. And they the third one, they, they crimped the cables. It's all production problems, but yeah. that 0 for 3 start was pretty terrifying. That's terrifying. Yeah, I would agree. And it's like 2 or 3 in the morning. I'm down in Virginia. The whole company's hinging on this installation. Of course. Uh, it ended up working out really well, but that was... um. Yeah, kind of a funny story. Yeah, I mean, companies are made and broken on the backs of FedEx all the time. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, but once they once they used it and they just standardized, every new FedEx truck got one of our products. That's so and then cool. all of a sudden, every other truck company saying, well, I want what FedEx has. And nice. Volvo, who wouldn't pick up the phone to talk to me before then, FedEx says, hey, by the way, I'm ordering you know, a, a thousand trucks. I want a hundred with this system in it. Volvo's going to do what FedEx tells them to do. Yeah, of course. So all of a sudden, Volvo's calling us saying, hey, we need to get your product in here. Whereas before, they would never talk to me. So now we not only had everybody looking at FedEx saying, we want to follow what FedEx is doing. Volvo now had it as an option. So if you're buying a Volvo truck, it'd be easy to say, oh, click the assistware box. Oh, that's awesome. So it was um, that was a pretty cool inflection point, but it was very nerve wracking at the time. I 
I feel like everything worth doing is like I've never done a project where I felt accomplished and there wasn't a moment where I, I didn't think like I don't know if I can do this or not. You know? Yeah, and if you if you're at that point where it's going so well, you're starting to wonder where the shoe's about to fall hard. You want to find, <laughs> you know, something bad's going to happen, so you kind of want to get out of the way early. And I used to tell like whenever we have a problem with a product and we have a, and it's early. I'm like, hey, that's good. We're getting out of the way early because you don't want that problem at the very bitter end. So I always look at those me. problems as, as a positive thing. Yeah, well, I mean, every problem. I, I think if you're smart, right? <laughs> I always say I don't mind making a mistake so long as I don't repeat it. And so, I mean. I think that's what your guys did. I mean, if they, you know, the fuse, the the crimp fail, I mean, that's all that's all learning, right? I mean, right. that that all made it better. So, um, yeah, and it was so they were easy things. Thing. They weren't fundamental problems. They were just for sure. I mean, the, the fact that that's what I mean. That's not to even to do with the product. I mean, that means your core product functioned. It was just you know, like you said, integration installation. Yep, but that's where the rubber hits the road. That's why that's why when you maintain your manufacturing, it says those touch points are things that you just can't. You don't learn nearly as well if somebody else is doing it 10,000 miles Yeah, away. you never learn in the lab or in the test environment. Like, just certain factors you can't always simulate perfectly. That's right, including experience. the stress of a VP telling you he's going to kick you out of their plant. You can't simulate that either. Oh, my gosh. That is poor guy's his first day in the job, and, you know, I'm freaking out. I'm getting yelled at, and he's just like, what the hell did I just sign up for? <laughs> So, he just um, signed up with you. That's amazing. It was his first day on the job. Was this trip? Wow. So, that must have been I, difficult to manage. Like, you know, just all all of that. Yeah, it was. Um, it was. I, I, you know, I guess my view on that. You got if you're transparent with everybody, I find that solves a lot of problems. Yeah, I feel the same. Yeah, way. I didn't have to. I, mean, didn't have I, to I try to give my say, people the maximum amount of data because I mean, you, you just miss out on so much. I mean, they respect it, and and they can also give you ideas. I mean, if if stuff right. is, you no, know, I mean, you're 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 missing out on all the brain power of all those people if you're not giving them the tools they need to actually contribute. Yes, yeah, so if I was trying to manage his expectations or manage his worry, um, treating him like a baby, that would have been stressful. Instead, it was like, hey, we're in this together. Just help me out. And uh, yeah, he was great because he was kind of the voice of reason through all of it. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't you, panicking. You kind of have to, right? You're just like, all right, it's, it's either going to yeah. get solved or it's not. But it's definitely not if I don't, you know, keep it together and work. So. Exactly. And I, you know, I wasn't freaking out in a bad way, but I was just getting very puckered up and like, this is, this, this could be bad. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I've said that before. Like, I mean, there's been times when I've had a team working on something with a client where, I mean, it's very obvious if we don't deliver that, you know, we're going to lose the business and nobody's going to get paid. Um, and so, well, I mean, we'll get paid then, but like n next week isn't going to be a thing. So, right. you know, I mean, I think in those situations, like you said, you just got to be upfront with your folks and be like, look, I mean, yes, there's a real chance we'll lose this account if we don't deliver. And so, I right. mean, it's all in your control still. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, we, we just have to, you know, pull a rabbit out of a hat here, uh, or, you know, we can decide to, to not have this account next week. I mean, this is within right. our control. I mean, a little bit of luck for sure. Always. I mean, you can't control everything. Oh, it's a huge amount of luck. Timing, right customer, right time. Um, yeah, luck is the weather being the way you want it to. Your You're vendor's never not, smart. not pulling the rug out from under you. I mean, there's a lot of things that could go wrong for sure. Yeah, I think some of the most successful companies and some of the failures are not that far apart. No, there's a there's a thin line there. That I think a lot of people don't appreciate. There's a there's quite a bit of luck involved on both directions. Yeah, yeah, I, I I could agree with that. You like to think there isn't because the world is is a nicer place to live in that way in, in some ways, right? Because you know if you if you do everything you're supposed to and you show up on time and you're, but yeah, yeah. of course. I mean, people that's, that do that get you know. Don't. You're more likely if you do the right things, but it's it, there is you're um, stacking the deck in your favor. Exactly. But you're not, you can't, you can't, that doesn't guarantee anything. And, and the most successful people didn't always do it because they were that much smarter or better. Sometimes they got lucky too. The timing is just right or wrong. So yeah. I probably need to wrap up here. No worries. Not... Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on. Is there anything you want to plug while you're here? Like anything like website, product, side hustle, uh, I, I, main hustle? I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I wish I had something to plug right now, but how about when I have something to plug, you bring me back? And we'll yeah, you should come way. back. And this has been really fun. Uh, Maybe in person next time. Like we could, we could just that would be out. cool. 
Yeah, that, that would be good. Yeah, no, not really. I think um, I think the biggest thing for me is I, the last year's been rough for everybody. We've seen a lot of problems in the, like I said, supply chains become a oh, supply chain, supply chain, supply chain. But for years, I've said that we need to manufacture in house and we need to maintain control of our our vendors. I'd rather use local vendors. My products were always built off local vendors. I'm hoping now's the time people finally say, you know what? Yeah, let's do it because we can. We have the technology, we have the intelligence, we have the we have everything here to do it. We just need the willpower to do it. So I'm hoping this is the some good things come out of COVID. You know, yeah. um, my son runs track. Um, his season was canceled, but we got to spend several months training together. You know, when he would have been off with his team or something else, and he ended up having a phenomenal high school career. He's running in college now, but I I got to spend six seven months riding my bike while he was running. So while That's COVID cool. was horrible. That was a memory I'll never forget and never, I would have never had without it. I was working from home. He was training on his own. We got to spend that time in bond and it was awesome. So there's a good thing that can come out of this crap. And I'm thinking the good thing that comes out of it industry wide is we learn how to make stuff in this country again. Yeah, well, I had some really cool professional accomplishments too, just during COVID. And by the way, making things in this country, you heard it here first, (laughs) www.formlogic.com. Mike Perfect. from Micah says you should go there and, and buy all your high precision aerospace. <laughs> buy local. Got to buy local. Med parts uh, made right here in Pittsburgh. So. Yeah, you'll have to win. If you're allowed, I'd like to come down and get a tour. So you can. Uh, yeah, I, I would assume so. Um, I'll, I'll obviously run it by, but probably. Let's see why not. Check it. I, I'd love to see what you guys are up to. So um, Absolutely. I'm inviting I'm inviting myself down in exchange for this uh, hour and Let's a half. Let's stick around after you. this uh, and uh, we'll, we'll set it up. That sounds great. Right, thanks for coming on, man. All right, thanks, Ben. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button. Or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening, and please come to the next one.